So I'm going to talk today about uh, a project that we uh, evaluated in Sierra Leone. And it changed the title relatively recently uh, to be talking about both the promise and the risk of technology. And this was, some of the results here were really quite a surprise to us. Um, and uh, as you'll see, as we go through. So I want to just give a little bit of background so that people understand uh, a bit about the context in Sierra Leone. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. 35% uh, of the population are undernourished. And for children, that translates into some really horrific statistics in terms of the numbers underweight, stunted, and wasted. Uh, one of, as you've already heard, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, very low yields uh, in, in cereals. Rice is the main staple crop in Sierra Leone. And if you just compare uh, yields in Brazil, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, India, and then Sierra Leone, it's you know, just over uh, one ton per, uh, per hectare, which is you know, a tiny fraction of the kinds of yields that, that, that people are getting in other places. And that's partly for the reasons that uh, Craig was talking about virtually no irrigation, uh, no use of m less than 5% of farmers use fertilizer, very less than 5% use improved seed varieties. So we're really talking about you know, one of the, the worst adopters um, in, in the sub-Saharan context. But the other thing I want to talk about is, is seasonality. Uh, because it's not just about how much you eat, um, it's when you get to eat. And you see these very important cycles, uh, seasonal cycles, in when people eat in these very poor countries. So this just brings together three things. Uh, one is hunger, a measure of hunger. So w at what time are people skipping meals? And you'll see that in August and September, July, August, and September, uh, you know, in August, 80% of people are, are skipping a meal. Uh, then, and this also correlates, though, with, with the high price of purchasing rice and, and running out of your rice from the previous year. So in August is the peak time when you run out of rice from the previous year, and yet it's exactly when rice prices are high. So the yellow line gives you the price of rice, of local rice, and you see that it's, you know, it's quite high. And then as soon as harvest comes in October, it suddenly dramatically falls. So people are facing, you know, they've run out of their own rice. They don't have money to buy rice, and the price of rice is very high, so they end up just not eating very much for a couple of months, which is extremely bad for your nutrition. You know, it's not like you can eat some parts of the year and not in others. Um, so this motivated uh, the following research design. We wanted to look at two, uh, two, for, two new technologies. One is Narika, New Rice for Africa, which is sort of a wonder rice, which has had a lot of hype um, behind it, but is, uh, has taken off in some countries, but not in others. It has early maturation, so it's 90, it, it takes 90 days versus some rices that take you know, almost twice that uh, to mature. It's high yielding, and it has a slightly higher protein content too. Rock is, is a local variety, which is a high yielding variety, but it's much more similar to what farmers are used to. So Narika is very different in many dimensions, uh, whereas rock is kind of more normal, but is, is a higher yielding variety. So we introduced these two different varieties. We also looked at what people would be willing to pay for these new varieties, and we randomized different villages, got different prices. So if you tried to buy Narika, it would be twice what regular seed rice is in the community, although it's actually very, very hard to even get hold of it. So most of the farmers we're giving it to couldn't, wouldn't be able to buy it. Um, and we also were interested in this question of training. Um, when you're introducing an entirely new product and two ones which, you know, one is very different from what you're used to, how's it, how important is it to provide training on that new product? 
And we worked with SLARI, which is the Agricultural Research Institute um, in Sierra Leone, and developed rock, for example, um, themselves and, and adapted Narika to Sierra Leone, and the IRC, which of course is a big international NGO who were interested in learning more about what they could do on agriculture um, because they were seeing this very uh, strong you know, potential link between nutrition and, and agriculture. So the first basic takeaway is, you know, maybe not entirely surprising, you know, demand, the basic demand curve, but uh, everyone will take the rice if you give it to them for free. Uh, and, but only 21% of people will, would take the rice if we charge the full price for it and somewhere in the middle at half price, which is this basically the same cost as you would have to pay for a regular seed rice. So maybe not entirely surprising. And now we get on to yields. <laughs> and um, I should say I'm going to give one caveat, which is the seed wit that we gave out in one district had weevils in. <laughs> so um, which turned out that we had, there was very poor germination. Um, so it was our, you know, our mistake in, in storing the rice before we handed it out. So I'm going to give most of the results are without Port Loco district um, because you know, that, that rice basically just failed. So these are, uh, this is, we've got our, th th here I'm just presenting, I'm getting rid of the, the price changes for here and I'm just looking at the, the training effect. So we've got the control group, this is the yield on their rice farms, then the treatment with no training, so you get, and this is just Narika, you get the improved seed, but you get no training on how to use it. And then the last group is you get this new seed and, and training. And you see a potential answer to this puzzle of why aren't people taking up new technologies. Because if you take it up and you're not trained on how to use it, your yields actually fall. So we see a 14% fall in yields, and this is on all your rice farms. So you're only growing the Rika on part of your farm. This is yields in your, to your average yield for the whole farm, and you're getting a 14% fall if you take on a new technology and you're not trained on how to use it. Uh, and then you get a 50, but you get a 15% increase in average yields. Again, only part of the farm is Narika, but your average yield is going up by 15% if you get Narika and you're trained on it. So it really is a wonder crop if you know how to use it. And we've dug, in, dug into the data to try and understand what it is about Narika that people are getting wrong. And one of the things is that it, it's, if it's slightly wet, when you plant it, it won't germinate. So you have to be really careful in how you handle the seeds and dry the seeds. And if you don't get it exactly right, um, you will, the crop will just completely fail. And this we see um, somewhere I have, maybe in the next slide, I have uh, a failure rates. But the other thing that's interesting about Narika is the timing, because as, you, as I pointed out, it's a much shorter maturation uh, of, of the seed. So, and if you think back to that seasonality of eating, you have the potential for the harvest to come at a time when people don't, literally don't have any food. So we see here that the groups that are most likely to have Narika, the people who are getting free Narika and therefore are most likely to buy Narika, are seeing their harvest, their first week of harvest, come four or five weeks earlier than everybody else. So we have the potential here for, now it's interesting because if you talk to agronomists about Narika, they get really excited by the fact that it's a short, short duration and therefore people can grow three crops in one year. Nobody does that. None of our farmers do that. But they are, they are interested in growing and it coming earlier because then they have something to eat in September when otherwise they wouldn't have anything much to eat in September. So it's interesting how you know, differences in the how the farmers see the benefits and how the agronomists see the benefits. One of the reasons I think they don't plant multiple crops um, on one, on, you know, on the same plot in, in one year is they deliberately stagger their crops so that they're harvesting one rice in you know, September, another in October, another in November, and they, 
And so if you were to replant, then they'd be trying to harvest two crops at the same time, and they can't do that. So they're already using their seed as their financial instrument. They're using the staggering of their planting to stagger their income flow as much as they can. But there's no seed that lets them, except for Narika, that lets them generate income in, in the end of August, beginning of September. Here's where we see the answer to why it is that you see lower yields with Narika without training. And it's because you have much higher failure rates, uh, partial or, or, and this we think is becoming, coming from the wet seed. Now, again, think through the timing issues. You've got, you've got um, this rice appearing before when the, the price of rice is high and you're getting a harvest when nobody else is getting a harvest. This is showing up in people are buying much less imported rice in Narika villages. So farmers that have free Narika are mess, much less likely to purchase imported rice because uh, they're having to buy rice when their stocks have run out. They remember, their stocks run out in August. The price of rice is high, and that's when people are buying imported rice, but much less so in the Narika groups. So we're really seeing evidence of this, um, of this timing effect, too. And finally, uh, I want to talk about, in terms of the results, I want to talk about the link between nutrition uh, and agriculture, which is something that we all hope to see, but there's not a huge amount of evidence on so far. And so what we did is we went back to the field and measured the BMI of in the families who were getting Narika. And we see that we actually have statistically significant difference in BMI of kids under 10 uh, for in the, in the, amongst the farmers who were given free Narika. So my, my sense is this is probably not coming from the timing so much as it's coming from just higher yields, but we can't distinguish that yet. Uh, but now, in the US, you might worry that higher BMI is a bad thing. <laughs> in this context, it's a really good thing. So the cutoff for under, for sort of low weight is, and this is, we're, clumping everybody together who's under 10, so it's not you know, the best thing to do. I'm giving you a very summary measure for BMI. You should really look at it maybe more by age. But the cutoff for low weight in this context is 18. So the average person, the average under 10, has below you know, the cutoff for an appropriate BMI. So you're really moving them closer to a good cut, a good BMI. So these, the, you know, the average kid here is on the verge of being underweight and stunted. So it's really pretty low BMIs, and yet we're seeing, you know, a significant increase in BMI uh, from probably, uh, I would say, as a result of the high yields. So that's obvious, right? We should give everyone Narika and train them how to use it. Well, not so much. <laughs> Uh, we still have one more step to go because what, let's try and put a cost benefit on what is the benefit of Narika. So we take the mean control yield, uh, we look at the additional yield from the treatment and training group and try and value that in terms of dollars. Now, what, how much do we think is the maximum potential of Narika? We don't think everybody, people are going to plant Narika on their entire plot because, as I've said, you want to stagger your rice uh, and use different kinds of rice so that your harvest is staggering over the whole of the fall season so that your income is slightly more smoothed. Um, so let's assume maybe they planted Narika on 70% of their farm. That would give us about an $80 benefit to planting Narika. Uh, this is a context where the GDP per capita is about $500 um, uh, in extra, you know, using not PPP, but... Um, and, and then if we take a net present value of that, because Narika is something where the trait doesn't go away, you can replant it, you only have to buy it once, that's about $174 benefit from growing Narika. 
Unfortunately, our training costs more than $174. So I think the next challenge to thinking about scale is how do we make sure that we can train farmers in how to use Noeka for less than $174 per head, and then we have a real you know, potential value proposition here. But you know, this is another thing that we have to worry about, is doing that kind of training at scale cost-effectively is not an obvious thing to do. I think it's easier now we think we've isolated what it is that people are getting wrong about Noreka. Uh, we think that they're, you know, not drying the seed correctly. Uh, but this is, um, and this is what we'd potentially like to do next. But, you know, it should be possible, I think, to try and do a training for less than, less than $174. But it's, um, you know, it, doing that at scale is definitely a challenging thing. So this wasn't where we expected to get, be when we started this. We thought the training wouldn't go, be very helpful. And we end up finding that actually it's terribly important to combine training with, uh, with the introduction of a new technology, which leaves us with the challenge of how do you do that cost effectively and at scale, which is something, fortunately, other researchers in the ATI community have been working on too. Thanks. <laughs>